Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 222, recorded on January 5th, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. The show is at its new time, but it is still the holidays. So there's not a lot going on in the news, but we did pick a few stories we thought were worth talking about, and one that, well, really makes me smile. It seems the future of the GNU PG project is quite bright, and they don't really need your donations anymore. Yeah, GNU PG maintainer Werner Koch posted an update on the project and its new associated GNU PG VS desktop line of business that is, yeah, as you put it, going quite well. Writing, quote, For many years, our work was mainly financed by donations and smaller projects. Now, we have reached a point where we can benefit from a continuous revenue stream to maintain and extend the software without asking for donations or grants. This is quite a new experience for us, and I'm actually a bit proud to lead one of the few self-sustaining free software projects. Yeah, and then he closes with, so you don't need to donate. If you had a recurring PayPal, it's been canceled. Uh, And he says that they really have a sustainable project now. And if you look at the history of this, it goes back to really contracts that came from the German government to implement open source solutions when they were bouncing back and forth between Linux and Windows. And they needed to bring their GPG system with them. And it's developed now into a full-fledged business that is supporting this critical open source project. And it's so, it's so rare that this happens these days. It just it feels like that after Log4J. Yeah, it's nice to see years and years of hard work making software that the public can use at large, you know, actually paying off and being recognized that not only is it just suitable for general encryption needs, it can also, you know, maybe with just a little investment, be up to snuff for government security as well. You know what does strike me about it, though, Wes, is what's making money isn't the core GNU PG, right? That's It's part of what's making them money, but it's this product that they've built on top of it, really for the Windows platform, that is bringing in enough revenue that it can fund development of the core technology that we all use in the open source community. I just find that kind of ironic. Yeah, I think it's an example of, you know, open source developers really having to be a little bit clever and go above and beyond to to make things work out financially, you know, where you can actually get a whole bunch of revenue and what exactly the best path for the pure open source project. Those aren't always 100% aligned. Something I've noticed for years now, maybe way too long, is that right around the New Year's, speculation about Fuchsia OS always starts percolating. It's coming for Linux, you know. Yeah, well, they are, is this the year, right? <laughs> That's always the question. It could be. <laughs> it could be. And and I think for those of you that are curious, you're not familiar with it. We have talked about it on the show before, but Fuchsia is a Google project, and it's designed to be entirely modular that really just means you can touch and adjust the system or change libraries and applications, remove things entirely, and it doesn't affect the core system. And then it uses a lot of modern technologies that a lot of developers are excited about, besides just C and C++, of course, but things like Rust, Go, and Dart in the, are in there. And then the, the native front-end applications for the user environment, well, that's all Dart and Flutter, which has a bunch of excitement around it. And last but not least, there's the kernel, Zircon. Yeah. This isn't Linux here. It's its own kernel, something of a micro kernel with a lot of stuff left to be implemented in user space. Now, we all know there can be a lot of advantages to that. It doesn't happen with our beloved Linux kernel, but the folks over at Fuchsia are trying to make that work in a modern set of tools and operating systems and systems for security reasons, for maintainability reasons. I mean, I think that's what's kind of interesting about watching Fuchsia happen is it's just taking some ideas that aren't as mainstream right now and playing with them. And it's no longer just a test ground either. It's it's in production. Uh, In fact, Google just announced another IoT type device is switching over to Fuchsia. So they don't necessarily seem to be going after Android devices right now, but things like the Nest Hub and devices like that, they're swapping over to Fuchsia just right out from underneath the user. You can tell if you dig around deep enough, but you really have to know what you're looking for. And I I don't know really if Android or Linux have to worry today, because I think initially, if I were to guess, 
Fuchsia will be the OS for people who don't want Linux. I know it's it's shocking to hear it, but there's actually a customer out there looking for a solution not Linux. For whatever obviously incorrect reason, that is actually a customer base. And I think those people will be the first in line for something like Fuchsia. And hey, you know, it is open source. The question will be what kind of open source, how friendly will it be to non-Google use cases, and where will it go from here? But right now, I just don't know. Oh, and we have a link in the show notes to a Fuchsia emulator, a portable Fuchsia emulator. If you want to if you want to play around with it, link in the notes. Well, speaking of Google operating systems, if you've ever used one of those x86 Android tablets, you'll know the experience isn't always great. But there's some interesting forthcoming work in the Linux kernel that might make things a little bit better. Yeah, it seems this is going to land in Linux 5.17, and it's a driver that aims to fix up a lot of these limitations. This is something that Michael Arbel has been watching closely, and he has a write-up we'll link to in the show notes. The gist of it is these x86-based Android tablets, um, Yao Mei makes some of these, uh, Asus made some of these, they have some quirky ACPI issues, and amongst other things. And so this driver is looking to cover as many of those quirks or mistakes, whatever you want to call it, as possible to allow these aging tablets to work fine with a mainline Linux build. And one of the examples they have here is the Asus Mimo Pad 7, which is pretty old. It, it originally shipped eight years ago with Android 4.4, but now after this patch should be in a lot better shape for mainline Linux. Yeah, this is nice to see. I mean, it's nice to see mainline Linux getting, you know, better Android device support in general for a variety of reasons, not least of which is, hey, maybe eventually these Android devices will stop using such gross custom kernels. But this is also great for owners of these devices that might still have some uses for them, long after the manufacturer has stopped caring about them. The GNOME project's Libidweta, the much-talked-about Libidweta, has hit 1.0. This is a library for implementing the GNOME human interface guidelines, and it's going to play a big role in GTK4. Yeah, in GTK4, Libidweta is basically the successor to the role that LibHandy played in GTK3. Now, you should note, though, some of these changes are not fully compatible with the GTK default. So there will be some changes you might have to make to an application while you're porting. That's pretty aggressive, but there is some nice things that you gain here. Um, they have some great examples on the GNOME blog, which we will link, especially around those of us who like to use dark variants. Now there's essentially a standard way for this to be implemented. Before, uh, the dark mode that was in GNOME wasn't really meant to be used at the level it has been. It was more for specific applications that needed a dark environment, like a, a movie player that maybe has a theater mode. That kind of basic functionality is what all the theme makers built on to create a dark mode for GNOME. But now, this dark variant that they have is built into Libidweta, and that means that things look really good. And you'll have to see the screenshots in the show notes to see what we're talking about. But I would say it turns out on the typical GNOME desktop, there's probably four or five, six little edge cases that we've all just kind of gotten used to, but really shouldn't be that way. And historically, changing these things has been a really big lift, just the way that uh, GTK did this. And so now, Libidweta is, or Libidweta is splitting all of that out into smaller, manageable files. So it, we may actually see it, it leads to more artistic license on the GNOME desktop down the road. We might. Yeah, you know, that really speaks to my inner developer. Sure, it may not be exciting outside, but when you have a big maintainability increase, I think you're exactly right, Chris. Like that, that just means it's easier to work on the, on the project. That means you can get bugs done without having to pull your hair out. That's just good for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice to see now like an official supported API that's cross desktop for dark style, which means that should now eventually work across GNOME and elementary or GNOME and Mate or GNOME and Plasma. That's great. And there will be some adjustments to make room for that. But long term, it's better to have these things as a supported API. There also are some regressions, at least compared to LibHandy. There are some regressions that uh, mean that some swipe gestures will no longer work with the mouse. You have to actually use a touchscreen. 
And that's just going to require an update down the road to fix that kind of stuff. And I imagine as time goes on, we'll hear of a few other edge cases that come up where things don't work. But it truly is a 1-0. And I think it's a little unfortunate that the conversation around this started as no more theming on GNOME because that's not really what's going on here at all. And it gives us some new base functionality that everybody gains. Yeah, it certainly seems like a necessary step to move forward. Sure, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of stuff that we'd like to see change in GNOME, at least many of us. But yeah, congrats to the team. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 and 60 day credit on a new account. And you go there to support the show. Linode is fast, reliable. It's the Linux geeks cloud. Go try it for your next project. It's what I use when I'm just testing things out. I have been experimenting with a new server, PhotoPrism. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you can privately host and organize and share your photos. And it also can do the kind of Google photo style image recognition. I wanted to throw a lot of bandwidth and a lot of processor at this. And I wanted a lot of disk IO. So that way I could just test it and just figure this out. Cause I only had about a half hour to spend on it. And Linode has recently been rolling out NVMe PCIe storage. And that's just a game changer for applications like this, where I'm analyzing the photos. It makes such a difference and they can help you sort that stuff out too. They have fantastic support, the best in the business, 24 seven, fantastic customer support. I mean, you know, the kind of performance that MVME drives can offer. And then on their high end CPU systems, they have AMD Epic processors. So if you're a performance hound or your application needs a lot of storage throughput, Linode can really help you get something dialed in. And they're 30 to 50% less than the hyperscalers they're going to try to lock you in. And they have 11 data centers around the world, so you can go try it out yourself. They've been doing it for 18 years, and that $100 really lets you kick the tires. Go try it out and see for yourself. Linode.com slash LAN. That's Linode.com slash LAN. And a big thank you to Ting. Linux.ting.com. If you're sick of overpaying for cell service, Go see how much you could save and take $25 off at linux.ting.com. They're an MVNO or a mobile virtual network operator. That means Ting gets access to the big nationwide carrier networks, but with way better customer service and at a lower cost for you. And Ting Mobile has the nationwide coverage you're looking for, LTE and 5G networks. And Ting was recently named the number one carrier by Consumer Reports in 2021. How about that. I already knew. I've been a customer since 2013, but it's nice to see Consumer Reports catching on. It's just a smarter way to do mobile. They have plans to start at $10 and go up from there. You can get the plan that has just the right amount of data. They have plans with unlimited calls and texts for $35 a month. And every plan gets Ting's award-winning customer service. They'll always make sure that you're taken care of. And you have the freedom of no contracts ever. It's simple to switch to Ting. So just go to linux.ting.com. Put in your information, get started. See if your phone's compatible, at least. See what might be available in your area. And then create an account, order a SIM. You're going to pop that in your phone once you receive that in a couple of days, and then you're going to be off to the races. It only takes you a few seconds to get activated via the Ting website. It's simple to start saving money every single month. Why not get started at the beginning of the year? And then at the end of the year, you can look back and see how much money you saved. Linux.ting.com. There's been a lot happening over at the Matrix Project over 2021, and seemingly a lot planned for 2022. And since it's been a little while since we checked in over there, and they recently published a huge breakdown of a lot of those goings on, well, we thought we'd take a look and highlight some of the stuff that stood out to us. And we have to start with some of the big breakthroughs they made in stabilizing memory usage in the Synapse home server. Now, that's the home server powering Jupyter Broadcasting's Matrix server and a ton of production home servers out there. And, well, it's safe to say that until now, it kind of ate as much RAM as it could find. But even the behemothmatrix.org Synapse server now apparently only uses 2 to 3 gigs of RAM, despite having more than doubled up to 1.1 million active users over the course of the last year. That's nice to see, isn't it? Uh, that is an area we've been chasing since we launched our Matrix server. I mean, I know they have other things in the works, which, which we will get to, but it's good to see Synapse still getting love. Yeah, it really is. 
Another big feature that caught my eye was the addition of threads. Now, okay, they're not actually quite out there in the lab right now, but that classic threaded model is finally coming to Matrix. And, you know, because it's Matrix, this wasn't just a hack it in thing. No, there's been a lot of changes and conversations and debates and discussions about how to get this right and how to make it work well in the system that is the Matrix we have today. Yeah, you, you can't just have any old API. You got to have one that all the different clients can implement. So beyond just the software, though, there's been a lot of high profile open source projects that adopted Matrix all over the place throughout the year. Uh, just to name a few, Debian, Fedora, NixOS, Arch, Tor, Ansible, and many others. There's been online events that have been hosted on Matrix with hundreds of thousands of attendees. And Element has really continued to act as the flagship client and really a, a spot for example development and official SDKs. Like, I'm sure one of the very first places this new thread support will land is going to be an Element. And that, that continues to set a pace there. There has just been also a ton of work this last year that went into making VoIP calls really solid, the person-to-person -person VoIP calls, to make it maybe even your go-to solution for remote workers. And if you do switch over to Element for remote work, well, you'll be glad to know that 2021 saw the long-awaited creation of a dedicated cryptography team that's just focusing on improving encryption within Matrix. Now, of course, Matrix has pretty much always prioritized encryption, but it's something that needs constant attention, so it's nice to have finally seen that happening so explicitly. As for 2022, well, the project definitely has some ambitious goals, including to further advance their new Matrix Rust SDK and possibly get that in use in some of their mobile clients. They're also hoping to improve Dendrite, which is a second-generation home server written in Go, and if things go well, could eventually take over as something of the default home server rather than Synapse. I don't know why, Wes, but something tells me we're probably going to make the switch when that happens. I mean, after all, we got to review it for show content at some point in the future. But I, I really am really impressed with the rate and pace of development. And our Matrix community has been growing at a rapid pace, too. If you'd like to join our Matrix server, it is colony.jupiterbroadcasting.com. And we'd love to have you join us every single week. So go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. If you'd like to get an ad-free version of this here show, you can sign up to become a network member. Get all the shows ad-free, including Linux Action News. It's the only way to get Linux Action News ad-free. Jupiter.party. As for us, well, we'll be back next week with the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.